Our scripture lesson this evening is taken from the 28th chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. In chapter 27, you may remember that Paul experienced the great storm at sea, Eurocladon, Eurocladon, and the ship was destroyed and they were cast ashore on the small island of Melita, which is where we find them as we begin chapter 28. May we hear the word of our God. And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita, and the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed. Who also honored us with many honors, and when we departed, they laded us with such things as were necessary. And after three months, we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isle, whose sign was Castor and Pollux. And may God speak to us today through this portion of his holy word, and may his name ever be praised. Amen. On leaving the island of Melita, Paul took a ship of Alexandria whose sign, we are told, was Castor and Pollux. Well, I'm sure that many of you have read that statement in the 28th chapter of Acts and perhaps passed right over that or wondered just what that might be. Well, that is a reference to the 10th sign that we come to in the Zodiac, the sign of Gemini, as we again consider the true biblical meaning that God intended in these signs, let us now look at this. May I remind you that there are three books in the Zodiac, the first one which deals with the coming and the suffering of Christ, the first four chapters, the next four deal with the church which is brought into life by Christ and which was nourished and multiplied by him. And the third four, which we are now in the midst of, deals with the final conquest and coming again of Christ to conquer and rule and judge the earth. The sign of Gemini on uh, your planisphere, which I trust you have tonight, is found at about one o'clock on the face of the clock. And you will see there, uh, along the ecliptic, a picture of two men, two youthful figures seated. They are at rest. The one on, on your left has a club in his hand, but even that club is at repose, leaning against his shoulder. And the other figure on, uh, on your right has a harp in one hand and an unstrung bow and arrow in the other. Again, they are at rest. Here is a picture of those who have been mighty hunters or warriors who now are seated in joyful repose. They are called, as you may see, Castor and Pollux. 
Those were the Latin names. The Greek names for them were Apollo and Hercules. These are the names of the figures. They are the names also of the two bright stars which are found in the heads of each of these two figures. Now, in Grecian uh, mythology, uh, Apollo and Hercules were, of course, two great heroes. They were, they were the twin sons of Jupiter, and uh, they had done great uh, exploits, one of which was that they cleared the seas, supposedly, of pirates. And uh, that is one of the reasons, no doubt, that this ship was named Castor and Pollux, which would be the Latin equivalent of Apollo and Hercules, because uh, this, these two were very important to seamen. In fact, their name gave rise to the uh, then vulgar uh, form of cursing or swearing by Gemini or by Jiminy, we might say today, and I don't suppose that you knew where that came from, but it came from this particular sign and these two heroes that cleared the seas of pirates and became very important to those that sailed those seas. In the old Coptic, their name was Pimahi, the United, united in fellowship or brotherhood. And, the Hebrew, and in the Hebrew, it is thamim, which again means united. And now the question is, what is meant by this? Well, here we have a picture of the dual nature and mission of Christ. In other pictures in uh, the planisphere, in the zodiac, different aspects of Christ are set forth in separate figures. Now here they are both joined in these twin figures seated now in repose. They deal with the, the divine and human nature, with the mission of Christ as both prince and ruler and also savior and sufferer. The figure on your right, who is Apollo, the chief star, which means Apollo, and that means ruler or judge. So here we see Christ set forth as ruler or judge, the judge of all of the earth, great part of his redemptive task. And in the other figure on the left, Hercules, the star there means he who cometh to labor or to suffer. And you remember that Hercules did just that, and one of his greatest uh, accomplishments was uh, to cleanse the Aegean stables of their filth. And this one who came to uh, suffer, to labor so uh, assiduously for others is, of course, a beautiful picture of the suffering Savior who came to cleanse the filth of the world. Another star which confirms this, which is in the left foot of Hercules, the sufferer, is the star al Hena, which means hurt or wounded or afflicted. Again, a picture of the suffering of Christ as the one who was wounded uh, in the foot by the serpent. And uh, in the right knee of the figure on the right, Apollo, there is the star Mepsuta, which means treading underfoot. And again, this constant figure. You've heard me say this over and over again, the picture of one foot, stars in that foot, and, and individual after individual, meaning wounded, hurt, afflicted. And in the right foot, the stars indicating that one which treads underfoot, always going back to the Proto-Evangelium of Genesis 3.15, where the seed of the woman would, uh, would be hurt in the foot by the serpent, but he would crush the head of the serpent. And uh, the, another star, which is right in the middle at the waist of uh, the figure of Apollo, is the star Wasat, which means set. 
the work of these two being completed, they are now set down, even as we are told that Christ would, would sit down at the right hand of the power upon high. So we have here a beautiful picture of Messiah's peaceful reign where all of the labor and all of the suffering is accomplished and now he sits as judge and ruler, the God-man, the prince and savior of the world combined. And uh, a beautiful picture of the dual nature of Jesus Christ as savior and judge of the world. And when we look at the decans, the three sub-stories of this particular uh, chapter in, in the book, we see that there are some problems here. We've seen that the, the 12 major signs have been virtually the same everywhere in all of the various countries, but there are some variations in the decans. And in the first of these is the, the figure lepus, which is the figure of a hare or rabbit. Uh, which is under the foot of Orion, again the right foot of Orion about to trample him. However, this is a modern, relatively modern picture, and if you go back to the older zodiacs or planispheres, such as the old Persian planisphere, you see that it's not, the original was not the picture of a rabbit, but rather it was a picture of a serpent. And here again we have the picture of the evil one, the serpent, who is being trodden underfoot of Orion. Again, a, another picture of Christ that we looked at last week. Orion, who was the slayer of the lion, who uh, killed that lion that goes about seeking whom he may devour and uh, holds up the uh, slain skin and head of the lion, the club in the other hand, and uh, but now we see also that with his foot we have another picture over and over again. The picture of Christ who is going to slay the evil one. And so with his right foot he is about to step upon not a hare but upon the serpent. And the stars tell the story. The names of the stars make it very clear as to what is involved. These are the very ancient names of the star in uh, this uh, figure of Lepus, the brightest star is Arnibo, which means the enemy of him that cometh. And uh, Orion is that one that cometh. The brightest uh, star in Orion means precisely that. It means him that cometh, Betelgeese, that we talked about before. The huge star in the right shoulder means the branch that cometh. And now we see that under his foot is the enemy of him that cometh. Other stars in this serpent tell the story very well. Nebel, the mad. Sigur, excuse me. Sugia, the deceiver. And Rakis, the bound. In Arabic, it means bound with a chain. So look at the pictures that we have. The enemy of him that cometh. The deceiver, the mad one, the bound with a chain. And you remember the picture in Revelation 20 where John says that he saw the old serpent who was bound with a chain and cast into a pit. Here again a perfect picture of the, the serpent, the deceiver, that old serpent, Satan. The second, the, the, the problem exists with each of the three stories uh, subpoints the decans of this particular house. The second one is Canis Major, which of course means the greater dog. And uh, this is an interesting uh, constellation in the sky, and uh, we're probably all familiar with it. But again, this is a modern picture. In the ancient zodiacs, for example, the most ancient of all of the zodiacs, which I've mentioned repeatedly, is the Dendera zodiac, found on the roof of a temple in Egypt going back 4,000 years. In the Dendera Zodiac, this is called Apis, A-P-E-S, which means the hawk. And uh, that's a picture then of a hawk or eagle, natural enemies of the serpent coming down upon the serpent. 
And uh, the star there is the star Naz, which means sent or caused to come forth or coming swiftly down. And on the head of this hawk, there is a pestle and mortar uh, to use to grind things to powder, reminding us of the fact that Christ is going to thoroughly crush the head of the enemy as this hawk comes down upon the serpent. And here we have uh, a most interesting star, uh, the star Sirius, which is the brightest star in all of the heavens found in uh, this, this constellation of Canis Major. And uh, it is a magnificent star. It, on any night you can uh, see that star, if you can see any stars at all. And an interesting word, Sirius. It comes from the word Sar or Sir, either S-A-R or S-E-I-R from which root, by the way, we get the word Sir, S-I-R. And it means prince, the prince. And uh, Isaiah tells us about the gift of the Son of God, the, uh, the counselor, the wonderful counselor, the prince of peace. And frequently Christ is referred to as the prince, the prince of princes or the prince of the kings of the earth. And he is the, the Ser, or Sir, the Prince of all of the earth. And in this case, however, this particular star, Sirius, has been associated down through the centuries with great heat and uh, with evil things coming upon the earth. In uh, many centuries ago, uh, before the precession of the equinoxes turned that particular constellation away from the particular month where it used to come, it was connected with the coming of, of heat in summer. That is no longer true, but it did, did give rise to such things as the words of Virgil in talking about Sirius where he said, with pestilential, with pestilential heat, he infects the sky. And the writer Homer, 3,000 years ago, speaks of Sirius saying, whose burning breath taints the red air with fevers, plagues, and death. And we're reminded again of the first chapter of the Second Thessalonians when we're told that you that are troubled rest with us when the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not, not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here, this picture of the, the prince, this mighty one who is going to come with fevers, plagues, and death. I think it's very interesting when you put the name of this constellation together with this major star in it, the constellation or hawk, Naz, and the star Seir, S-E-I-R, and uh, you get the words Nazir. And we remember that Jesus Christ is called the Nazirene. He shall be called the Nazirene. Now, Naz means sent or caused to come swiftly, and Seir means prince. And so the Nazir is the sent prince the one who is sent forth quickly, the prince of all of the earth who is to come into the world. And it's interesting that biblical scholars were never able to locate that. It says that he shall be called a Nazarene. And uh, they have looked in vain in the Old Testament for some reference which uh, would indicate just what that is referring to without finding it. So though they have said in referring to the fact that he came from Nazareth that he would be a Nazarene, but there is no prophecy of that in the Old Testament. And yet the prophecy of it has been in the skies from the beginning of creation, that he would be the sent prince come into the world for us. So here we see a picture of Christ as the prince who comes to bring death and destruction upon the unbelievers. And the third and final 
of the decans of this particular house or particular uh, chapter of the zodiac is Canis Minor, the little dog. But again, this is a modern picture. And in the ancient uh, Dendera zodiac, the oldest of the zodiacs, it was a human figure with a hawk's head called Sebak. And uh, the brightest star in there is Procyon, which comes from words which mean the Redeemer or redemption. So here we have, I believe, in these two hawk figures, pictures of the same thing confirmed that we had in Gemini, where we have pictures of the two aspects of the work of Christ, both as prince, the one who comes to destroy the wicked, and the one who comes bringing redemption. This is further uh, supported by the next brightest star in this particular constellation, which is Gomesa, which means burdened or bearing for others. He's also called in the Arabic Al-Shaira al shamalea which means the prince of the left hand. So we have the prince of the right hand, which is what uh, Canis Major is called, and the prince of the left hand, corresponding perfectly to the two figures in Gemini, where you have Apollo representing the judge or ruler, and you have Hercules representing the one who comes to labor or to suffer. Here you have the Redeemer in uh, Canis Minor and the prince in Canis Major corresponding perfectly to the two natures of Christ and the twin task of his coming into the world. Remembering that Christ came into the world first of all to bring redemption and salvation to men to suffer, to cleanse the world of sin, but he promised that he would come back again, that he would come back not this time in humility, but, or obscurity, but he would come back in great glory, and every eye would see him, and all nations of the earth would, would moan and groan because of him, and that he would come to take his own to be with himself and to destroy the wicked forever in flaming fire. And we can take heart in that, as Paul says, says to us, you that are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. And we may know assuredly, as even the stars in the heavens tell us, that Christ is going to come back again, that uh, it will be for those who are unbelievers, it will be a very hard time. In fact, uh, the star Sirius in Canis Major, because it was associated with all of these terrible calamities coming upon the earth, the searing heat and so on, gave rise to another phrase which I'm sure you've all heard about, dog days. The dog days that arose from the star Sirius connected with the burning heat. Well, when Christ comes back again, I assure you that for unbelievers that will be dog days indeed, and it will be a time of flaming fire and searing heat, and we shall be redeemed from all of our and his enemies. And we can rest in that, that Christ has won the battle already. He rests at ease and repose in glory and uh, as far as things down here are concerned, it is simply a time of mopping up. The battle has already been won. And I think it's great that the brightest star in all of the heavens, the star Sirius, is a star which means the prince and which refers to our great savior, particularly referring to our savior in his return again to this world. And I hope that that will be an encouragement to you. And I hope that you'll perhaps uh, take the planisphere that you've been given and on a clear night when it's uh, where you can get away from the lights of the city, you'll perhaps look for some of these constellations and learn to discover where they are. And of all of the various stars that scintillate in the sky above, you'll find that far and away, the brightest of them all is the star Sirius, which points us
to him who has promised that he would return again. And we know not the day or the hour, but we can confidently rest in the fact that our great Redeemer, who labored and suffered and died, will come again in great, great glory. I remember somebody saying to me one time, they suppose that when Christ came back again, that people would not recognize him. And they probably would do the same thing that they did to him the first time that he came. And I laughed when they said that. I said, my friend, you apparently haven't read much about what the Bible says as to the manner in which Christ is coming. He is coming with a brightness that will eclipse the sun. Surely there is nobody who will fail to know that he has come. He will not be coming in obscurity, but in great glory, and every eye shall see him. And he will come in great power, and there is no one who will stretch forth a hand to take him or bind him or crucify him at that time. He will be seen as he really is in all of his majesty as the incarnate second person of the Trinity, the mighty God, the Savior of the world. We shall look forward to seeing the coming of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all of the world shall bow down and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. For some, it will be the continuation of a life of adoration. For others, it will be their last act before they are cast away forever. And my friend, I would only hope that as you look up at the sky and look at the great and bright and glorious star of Sirius, that you consider well, in fact, may I make a pun, that you consider seriously how will it be for you in that day when that one who is represented by that bright star comes back with a brightness that will put the star to shame to receive his own to himself and to destroy the impenitent and unbelievers. In which group will you fall in that day? May we pray. Father, we thank thee for the glorious picture of those great events which shall transpire one day in the future. And we thank thee that we can lift up our eyes to the brightest star in heaven and know that that is a picture of our prince, the prince of all of the kings of the earth. And as we consider these puny individuals who lift themselves up here upon this earth and cause men to quake with fear, may we know that all of them one day will be on their faces with their hands over their mouths and their faces in the dust before him who is the King of kings and Prince of princes. We thank thee that we belong to him, that by his great labors and suffering we have been cleansed from our sin and redeemed unto an eternal kingdom. For that we give thee our praise and our adoration in Christ's great name. Amen. My father, the late D. James Kennedy, had a passion for proclaiming biblical truth and applying it to every sphere of life. This ministry continues his unique mission of applying the Bible to important issues while also preaching the gospel and broadcasting it by any means possible. And we continue to make available Dr. Kennedy's messages, which are even more relevant now than when he originally preached them. They're only available from D. James Kennedy Ministries. To find out about other compelling DVD and audio CD sets, MP3s, and other unique resources, please call us at 1-800-988-7884. You can also visit us on our website at truthinaction.org, where you'll find sermons, featured products, DVDs, documentaries, and much more. Check out some of our other high-quality resources designed to give you a biblical worldview so that you can confidently share your faith and influence the culture for Christ. 
This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.